chapter 8, verse 7. And uh, this is after, it's a picture, I believe, of Jesus Christ and His church. But He talks about, uh, He sees His beloved, uh, sees His beloved coming out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved. And I believe it's really a picture of the birth of the church and a symbolic picture. And talking about that, because a lot of the Old Testament was imagery of what was going to happen in the new. The Bible clearly says that. The Old Testament was types and shadows that was going to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of people still trying to, uh, you know, say we got to live under the shadows. But the Bible clearly says we don't have to do that because once the substance came, the Bible says, the shadows were done away with. In other words, why do you want to still practice a shadow? In other words, why would you offer an animal sacrifice when you have Jesus Christ with what the animal sacrifice is pointed to? There'd be no reason for another sacrifice. The Bible clearly explains that when he died, that was one sacrifice forever for all the sins of humanity. So there, and Paul said, they're still though offering them. They're still standing in the temple offering things, he said, that can never take away sin. And where the blood of an animal does not take away sin. It was just pointing to Christ who came in His blood, went back and covered all those who faithfully offered an animal sacrifice till He could get here. And of course His sin, His blood covered everybody in the future that's going to turn to Him, believe His gospel, and obey, uh, obey what He has taught us to do. And by grace, we're going to be saved by faith. Amen. And. Uh, I want to read this one scripture here. It says, Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all, his, all the substance of his house for love, he, it would utterly be condemned. Now, that King James throws you off a little bit there. It would utterly be condemned. And you've got to read the other translations of the Bible to understand what it's saying. Actually, he would be contemned or his house would, would, they would think he was foolish. That's what one translation says. If a man would give everything he had for love, then a lot of people would think he was foolish. But you know, I really don't think he would be, but God, love is the thing that's being brought out here because that whole song is about the love of a bride, the love of a, a young lady that was birthed and, and uh, brought up to be wed. And I believe he's really speaking of the church because we are the bride of Christ. And we have been uh, ordained of God, and we are the purpose of God, really. Uh, we are the locus of God. We are the plan of God. A lot of people have come up with all these crazy ideas about God's plan. But uh, if you study the Bible very carefully, you'll find that the church, Jesus Christ and His church, was the plan of God before the world was ever made. Amen. It wasn't even a natural people. The natural people just represented a spiritual people. And when Jesus came, He broke down the middle wall of partition, the Bible says, between Jew and Gentile, and made both Jew and Gentile one new man in Christ Jesus. So it don't matter anymore if you're male, female, slave or free, if you're Jew or Gentile. If you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed, and you're an heir according to the promise of God. So this is what it was all about. And Bible strictly said the law was only given till the seed could come to whom the promise was made. And we know that seed was Christ. He was the one, Paul clearly said that. He said the promise of Abraham was not to the Jews under law. He said in the book of Romans. He said the promise that God made. Now people are coming today and say well, God's got to remember his promise to Abraham and go back and restore natural Israel. Well the promise of Abraham had nothing to do with natural Israel. Paul makes that very clear, especially natural Israel under law. Natural Israel is included in the promise because Jew and Gentile is included. But uh, he said the promise was to seeds one, not seeds many. He made it real clear in the book of Romans. The promise God that gave to Abraham was not to seeds many, but to one seed. And Paul said that seed was Christ. That makes it really clear, don't it? So the promise, now let us listen to the promise of Abraham. Abraham, of thy seed, I'm going to raise up a great nation. He gave it to him three times in the book of Genesis. And you look up the word nation there, it still has nothing to do with the Jews according to the Hebrew language. It is the Hebrew word goim that means a foreign people, hence a Gentile. 
Now listen to the interpreted promise of Abraham. Abraham of thy seed, Jesus Christ, I'm going to raise up a great Gentile nation. Now, the Jews are included in it because they were the first ones to become a part of this. But people have this idea that God's got to return to natural Israel in this, call it an end time scenario. But there is no scripture really for that, and I can prove that because when you trace all that out, restoration out, it all comes back down to the restoration took place at Calvary. And Israel was restored at Calvary by Jesus Christ. And there won't be a second restoration. He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. And if they come to God, it's going to be through Him. There is no other sacrifice anywhere that's going to save Jew or Gentile except Jesus Christ. Now, I believe that with all my heart. Amen. I'm committed to that. And uh, so I, I don't believe a lot of what men teach and say. I've got tapes out there. My tapes go, they're on the Internet free. I, get, uh, I had a man email me yesterday thanking me for taking a stand for truth. And he said it helps fight against all the false. I don't even know the man. don't even know who he is. But he got, got on my website. I get letters and I get uh, emails all the time from people I've never heard of, don't know who they are, thanking me for standing for truth and proclaiming truth uh, to help bring down some of the falseness that's out there. And that, of course, I'm dealing with in the message that I'm really going to be working on quite a bit here, strongholds of the mind. There's a lot of thoughts and ideas in Christianity that man has put in our minds that God had nothing to do with. Amen. And that's why I want to deal with the whole, I'm going to deal with it quite a bit. I want to deal with a lot of the ideas that have been put in Christianity that God had nothing to do with. And uh, they believe that, they think that, but it's really it's not biblical and it's not of God. And it creates a lot of fear. It creates a lot of doubt. It makes the church a concubine instead of the bride. And I can plainly take you to uh, the Bible in the New Testament and show you where natural Israel was called the concubine and the church was called the bride. So they got everything backwards from the word. So if somebody believes something but the word don't confirm it, guess which is right? I taught you this lesson. Who is right? The word or, or your belief system? The word of God is right. See, because he said, thy word is truth. All right, well, that's, that's for next time I preach, not for this time. All right. But see, we're dealing here, I want to just take that little thought about love and talk about uh, this subject today, motivated by a mother's love. And when you see that subject, a lot of uh, motivated means actually something that motivates you, when love motivates you to do things. And uh, we have a lot of examples in the Word of God where a mother's love actually motivated that person to do something very special in their life. And I believe that all true mothers, and especially women of God, women that have given their life to God, women that study the New Testament, women that are true Christian people, um, they really want to do what's pleasing to God. And, and so they are all motivated by a love. And it's just natural. A mother's going to love her children. That's just natural. If a mother don't love her children, something is unnatural about that. Hello. I said something is unnatural. They may be the ugliest thing you've ever seen, but to you they're the most beautiful thing you ever saw in your life. Amen. Praise God. And, uh, you know, no matter what they look like, and really when it comes to babies, a lot of them look a whole lot alike to me. I can't tell a whole a lot of different. Now, the only thing that Ashley's baby the other day, I looked at uh, her baby when he looked him straight in the face with his eyes open and a full head of hair, even though it was black, it looked just like Brad to me. I thought, boy, that's a little bitty Brad right there. Now, that baby looks different from a lot of babies. But uh, so you realize a resemblance there, and it's sometimes a father or mother, and sometimes that changes with age. I've seen babies when they were little. Uh, anybody remember the Zamoros that used to come here? Anybody? You remember that deal? He had a girl that looked just like him. A little girl. I mean, she looked just like him. And I said, brother, it looks a whole lot better on her than it does on you. <laughs> Praise God. I used to tell him that all the time. He'd always laugh, big old boy. <laughs> but uh, she, she, now she's married, got children of her own. Kids grow up. They don't stay little forever. But that's what parenting is all about. 
But we have the, even at the beginning of the Bible, we have the story of the mother of Moses, who lived in a time when uh, the king heard about a deliverer might come to Israel. And God had uh, begun to prophesy and talk about that. And so he wanted all the male children killed in Israel. He didn't want the, the Israelites to outnumber, you know, I mean, in, the, in Egypt. Let me get this right here. He didn't want the uh, Israelites to outnumber the Egyptians. So he ordered all the male children killed. And, uh, but Moses' mother, what later became named Moses, looked at the child, the Bible says, and saw that he was a fair child. And she felt in her heart um, that this is a special child. There's something special. I believe it was the Spirit of God just quickened her mind. said, this child is, is different. I've got to do something to protect this child. And I know we all feel like that about our child. My child is special. And, uh, you know, but she really, I believe, I believe it was more than just loving a child. I believe that she saw, felt something from the Spirit of God that this child had a special calling on his life. And uh, from what I can understand from reading that scripture, it seemed like it was more than just a feeling of love for a child. She said, I got to do something. I can't let them kill this child. I'm going to give it a chance anyway. And we know the story how she took a basket and uh, she wove it from the, uh, you know, the reeds there. And she put, fixed it somewhere how they did with clay or whatever they did. Sealed it where it would float and put him in it, put her baby in it, put a lid on it and pushed it out into the water. And... Uh, Moses' sister was watching all this, and she, she just, and she, of course, the mother prayed and wanted God to take care of this. And uh, as she pushed it out into the water, just trusting God, because she was motivated by love for that child and a love for God. And she just took a chance that God would do something. And she pushed it out into the water, and as God would have it, Pharaoh's daughter came down, you know how the story goes, to the river to bathe and uh, they saw that basket and she said go get that and they opened it up and said this is one of the Hebrew children that uh, the mother was trying to save it she said well I, I think I want to keep this child as my own you know and so Moses' sister was standing in the background watching all this she ran up and said uh, hey I got, you want me to get a nurse for her? you want to get somebody that uh, to, can take care of this child till a certain time she said, yes, I, 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 that would be good. So guess what? She goes to get Moses' mother, her mother, to come. Now, this is God's providence. You know, when God wants something to take place, man just can't do anything about it, can he? You know, God is just going to have it take place. And so uh, they went and got Moses' mother to come and nurse this child till he was grown or whatever age it was that she gave the child back to um, Pharaoh's daughter. And uh, I believe that she took Moses aside while she was raising him and said, you are not an Egyptian. I believe she got right up on his face, grabbed his cheek, said, you are a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You are not an Egyptian's child. They're going to take you and they're going to raise you, but you are a Hebrew. And she put that in his spirit. She put that in his mind. Because I know Pharaoh's daughter didn't do that. But when she finally gave him back, and Pharaoh's daughter was there, of course, uh, and, uh, you know, the Bible talks about, even in the book of Hebrews, how in later years he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but was willing to suffer affliction with the people of God. He refused to be a king's son. He refused to be, uh, a, you know, uh, in royalty. Uh, he wanted to be associated with the people of God even if it caused a certain amount of affliction and pain. He wanted to be in his true birthright. And so, so uh, as he was there and he got turned out on his own, the first thing he did was he saw an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew. And you know, the reason I know his mother had to put something in him because something rose up in him and he went and slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And the Bible tells then he saw two Hebrew children arguing, so he told them, look, well, y'all don't need to be arguing with each other like that. We need to be standing together. And they said, y'all, you're going to kill us like you did. He said, uh-oh, this is out. And sure enough, he was. The Bible said the 
king heard about it, the king of Egypt, the, the one that was in charge, the Pharaoh, he heard about that. So he was going to kill Moses. But Moses fled, and that's where he ended up getting his wife and meeting his, uh, meeting his family down in there and taking a life from another land, wife from another land. And Norse God called him to go back and become the deliverer of Israel. But it was just love for that child and love for God that motivated this great story in the Word of God. And there's a lot of them in here about such as that. And uh, we have uh, another one that's a sad story, but it was a lady named Rizba um, who had two sons. And uh, we find that, uh, that there was a famine in the land in that day. And so... Uh, David, it, was, it lasted for three years. And uh, David began to inquire of the Lord, what's the problem here? And uh, he said, well, you, you mistreated this nation. Saul mistreated. Now, it wasn't David. It was Saul. Even though we had a pact that was going to take care of this nation. It seemed like it was the Gibeonites, but I, I can't remember exactly which nation it was. I had to go back and read it, but... It was a nation that said, well, it wasn't even the people of God. It was just a foreign nation they'd made a covenant with. Careful how you make covenants. God honors covenants. We tend to not honor covenants, but God is a God of covenants. And I really only believe there's been two, the old and the new. Now, they got all these teachings out there, but I only find an Old Testament and a New Testament, an old covenant and a new covenant. And... Uh, so he's a God of covenants. He honors things. He used to remember how they used to make a, a covenant of salt. Matter of fact, it was in that covenant of salt one time that God appeared to Abraham and made the promise to him about his seed. We're going to bless all nations. And uh, that's why the, the Isaiah prophesied and talked about when when Jesus died, when he's took away, when Jesus when words when the Son of God dies. He will see, when he's cut off, in other words, or killed, he will see his seed. Well, how did he see his seed? Because that's when the church came forth. And the church is the seed of Jesus Christ. And that's why all the lineages in the Bible, Matthew and Luke, end with Jesus. Because Jesus is an everlasting father. If I ask you today, who is your spiritual father? What are you going to tell me? Jesus. If I asked Paul nearly 2,000 years ago, who's your spiritual father? And he asked, who art thou, Lord? And guess what the Lord said? I am Jesus that you're persecuting. He's the everlasting father now. He's the prince of peace. There won't be another father. If you come into the church, you've got one father. We are in the Bible called the generation of Jesus Christ. We are referred to in the Bible, and I, can, I do have proved this in my teachings in the past. I preached a whole uh, session once on the generation of Jesus, proving that the church is, is a generation of Jesus Christ. There will never be another father. There won't be anything else. You're in the church. You're in the church of the living God. That's never changed. And so <clears throat> we're one generation. We are the generation of Jesus Christ. And sometimes the word used in the New Testament is, that was used generation in the Old, it actually says the word church in the New. He, they quoted that scripture and used the word church in the New, showing you that the church is the generation of Jesus Christ. So we understand that, and we, we realize there will not be another generation. And so God is a God of coming. He, uh, he said they mistreated these people, and Saul went and killed them. And he said... Um, so David goes to the leader of this foreign nation, and he says, what can I do to make this right? He said, you know, uh, you've been wrong by Saul. And he said, uh, Saul and his zeal slew that people for no reason, that there was a covenant with them that they'd leave them alone. But Saul wanted to prove himself, you know, he was failing, he was falling away. He was no longer anointed of God. He had lost his anointing. And he was going to witches to get, try to hear from God. He was going to strange spirits. And it's a dangerous thing to lose contact with God. Sometimes people try to communicate with the wrong spirit when they do. And uh, so he said, you know, uh, 
he had done this in his zeal to try to bring Israel back to him. And God didn't like it. You know, sometimes we think, well, I just do this, you know, but God didn't like it. So he punished Israel, and the man that did it is already dead. And he's punishing Israel for this. Now, this is Old Testament. Because back then, when you did something, you had to answer for it. And so he punished Israel, and they were in this famine, and he said, well, what can we do? Well, could we talk to the king about you? Could we? No, we don't want that. We, we, we don't really want, we don't have gold. We don't really have any gold or anything. We, we don't really have nothing, they said. But I tell you what would appease us. We want seven sons of Saul to be given to us that we can hang them. So it wasn't even really... Uh, so much the sons of Saul as some of them become the grandsons of Saul. They were descendants of Saul. And so David went and took two of uh, actual Saul's sons, which this was her sons. And so and then he took five more that were actually just grandsons. And uh, two of them was Rizpah's sons. And uh, he gave them to this nation and they hung them and just left them there, left them hanging. And this was to appease what had happened when Israel broke their covenant with this nation. So the Bible says Rizba got her a little mat and she went out there and she spread it on a rock for her sons was. And the Bible says that she wouldn't allow any animals to come by night, nor the vultures or birds to come by day. Day and night, she fought away the vultures and the things would come and desecrate the bodies of her sons. And she kept them away. What motivated her? It was a mother's love for her children. Now, Rizpah was innocent, and actually, Rizpah's sons was innocent. This was something they, that their, their daddy did. Aren't you glad the Bible says in the New Covenant that the sins of your fathers won't be visited on the children? You know, I worry about some of these teachings about generational spirits. I'm going to tell you, there's no generational spirit my God can't break. If there's a generational spirit that can be handed down, now there's generational mindsets, and that's what I'm going to be preaching about some here. But as far as a spirit, because your daddy would, I know we influence things, but I don't believe that none of that cannot be broken by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can break everything. And I'm glad that we're living in a time that my daddy's sins is not going to be visited on me. Amen. I'm glad we're living in that time. But in that day, they were, even to the third and the fourth generation. And so she fought those things away, and, and the Bible said David heard about it. it were, everybody began to talk about it. This was amazing to the people of Israel because a woman could actually love her kids enough she would go out there and not let the animals desecrate their bodies. And they were all really that got killed were very innocent. They were just descendants. And so... She protected them, and David heard about it. So David said, I'm going to do something about that. You know, David as a whole, he made some mistakes, but overall, David was a very honorable man. And overall, David loved God. And he wanted to do what was right with God. And uh, that's why he went to this people in the first place. Because God said, this is the problem with the famine. Until this nation is appeased for what wrong was done to them, I'm, not, I'm going to punish Israel until this is appeased. And it actually comes with Jesus Christ. There's got to be a sacrifice for sin. There's got to be a Aren't you glad Jesus took all of our punishment on him? And we're not going to answer for the sins that we had to do. We could simply repent of them and be covered in his blood and get them washed away in his name and have that took care of. That's an awesome thing. Amen. And so we're glad we don't. I'm, I'll tell you, I'm glad I don't live in that day. And so uh, I'm glad I'm living in the new covenant. And uh, 
I'm begging you, children better be glad they're living in the, the new covenant because in the old covenant, when you got smart with your mom and daddy, they just took you out and stoned you to death. They didn't mess with you. They didn't put up with a lot of stuff like, you know, people have put up with today. You didn't stand up and say, no, I ain't going to do that. Make me. Hey, we didn't have to. There were three or four guys would grab you up with a collar and they'd take you out and stone you to death. You've been made. You've been made an example for anybody else who wants to do that. You know, so I'm glad yeah, our kids better be glad we're not living in that day. Praise God. But, uh, you know, it was heard. So David took the bones of Saul and the bones of uh, his son, Jonathan, and he took these seven sons and he put them in a proper cave and he buried them in the sepulcher. And she received honor. And she received what she was looking for. She no longer had to stay out there and protect. She just wanted her sons to have a decent burial. And God saw that she got. But all that was motivated by love and caring. And the sacrifice that some mothers will make is unbelievable. I've seen mothers that didn't have much to eat that would actually make sure her children had something to eat. Now, most of you don't know about kind of this kind of stuff. Because you come along in this day and age that we're living in. And most people today do not appreciate the prosperity that they live in. They take it for granted. And, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of like we got the kids today have everything. When I was coming up, at Christmas time come along, and I got one or two things, I was really blessed of the Lord. We got a lot of apples and oranges and uh, walnuts, not the kind, but these English walnuts, that kind you can actually break, you know, and get a nut out of it. And, and we got pecans, and we got, uh, that was special in our day, because you didn't have a whole lot. And, boy, if you got a bicycle, you were really in high cotton. <laughs> but now today's kids has got iPads, iPods, Internet. You can't even talk to them. If you come in your house, sit down, they're on the phone. They ain't even listening to you. They don't even know what's going on. Some folks can't even sit through church and stay off of them. I mean, just, I might miss something on Facebook. Well, you might miss something in Jesus, too. It'd be better miss something on Facebook than in Jesus. You know, we get so carried away with that stuff. But I, I saw a cute thing on Facebook, or some of you may have saw it. This woman said, uh, bought, bought her grandpa a brand new iPad, a nice Apple iPad, expensive thing. She said, Grandpa, how did you like the iPad? And he was cooking. And he come and he had the iPad in his hand. He had a bunch of vegetables on it. He just chopped them up on it. He said, did you like the apps? He said, what apps? And he just took it and scraped it over there. He took the iPad and scraped the vegetables off onto the table and went over there and and washed it off under the water and stuck it in the dishwasher. <laughs> and he looked up at her and she was just looking at me and said, what? <laughs> you know, some generations don't understand that stuff, you know. You hand us something flat, it's to bake something on. We don't, you know, we don't jive to all that. But uh, we're living it, uh, you know, we're living a day things are different and people don't have an appreciation for a lot of things that uh, we didn't have when I was growing up. And I'm not wanting you to have it hard. I thank God you got it. But I'll tell you what our, I think we've lost in this generation is an appreciation. I think children in this generation have lost, in some respects, a great appreciation for what mom and dad do for them. It's like it's your job. You know, you get a new iPad, someday you don't realize the sacrifice that was made. I know when we got anything, I didn't have a car in school. Now then, when they get 16, we got to figure a way to get them a car, you know. Or we're out of style, or they're going to be looked down on in school. So we got to go and almost go bankrupt trying to get them a car. You know what I'm saying? We got to go to the bank. We got to borrow money unless you're rich. I never was. But I never had a car. I, bought, I got mom and dad's car on Friday night. And Daddy gave me five dollars. That's all the money I had. I said, Daddy, I, I need, can you pay me? He said, you put your feet under this table, don't you, boy? Yes, sir. All right. That's all the payment you're going to get right there. 
You know, I worked in the maidens. I worked, I mean, I worked. I came up working. I worked hard. And Daddy felt like, now, they put me through college. They would do that kind of stuff for you. But as far as having your own car, you drove Mama's car, and you better not wreck it. And you better not be late. I mean, 11 o'clock or 12, whatever time they said, you better be home. Hello? It was different. I mean, we lived under strict rules back then. Because you don't wreck Mama's car because that's what Mama's driving to work. You know, so that's the way it was. Nobody, no kids had their own car hardly back in my day. This is the thing of this hour and day that we're living in where kids all have their own cars and stuff. But they don't really, really sometimes appreciate the blessings that God has put in our path. And uh, so, we, we, you know, I, I really feel that we've lost something there. I remember we, supper time in my day was really a special time uh, because... It was a time when the whole family got together. There were no iPads. There were no iPhones. Very little television. You know, I remember, I remember we got the first TV. Matter of fact, I posted some things about my mom yesterday. One girl posted, lived no neighbors to us, said, I remember we used to come to y'all's house on Saturday night and watch TV because we were the first people in Morro Bay, Arkansas that owned the television. We were blessed. My dad cut logs and trapped. So in their eyes, we were almost rich. We had an old black and white RCA Victor TV that you turn it on, and when you turn it on, a little dot came in the middle. A little white dot showed up. And then after a while, as it heated up, the dot began to spread. Got bigger and bigger and bigger. Some of you old folks is remembering this, ain't you? How many old folks know what I'm talking about? Yeah, look at now we're revealing our age. Yeah, and uh, you know it, it, it wasn't no color. Color was you didn't know what color it was. It was all black and white back in. And the Kingfisher was one of the main shows. Uh, Amos and Andy, and uh, Wagon Train, and Bonanza, and all that X-rated stuff. You know, but uh, it. Uh, so people would come over there because they considered that we, we were really blessed. And uh, I've had other people say, man, we used to love to come to y'all's house, neighbors. Because on Saturday night, our living room floor would be full of kids. The only thing you had to watch, occasional stinging scorpion would crawl, crawl across the floor and it'd sting somebody. We'd get a little action then. And because uh, we lived in them old houses, you know. But... Uh, we, we were, they thought we were blessed. He said, I remember coming to your house. He said, because Miss Willamay was the only person I ever knew that had iced tea even in the winter. He said, we couldn't believe it, y'all. Well, I drink iced tea year-round and eat the ice. Y'all ever wonder why me and Mike eat ice? Well, it's a traditional thing with us. And uh, so, you know, it's just something I've done all my life. And we loved iced tea. I thought everybody drank iced tea in the winter. I mean, I didn't know there was a time you drank iced tea. The only thing about it, if you don't like moving to Texas, you'll drink iced tea year-round without a problem. But, you know, and we, 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 didn't know we, we didn't know we were blessed as we were, but we really didn't have a whole lot. You know, my, I, my big thing in life was a pet chicken named Gertha and uh, a dog named Butch and... Uh, so I'd get out in the yard at two years old. I'd, I got pictures of her. I'd say, Gertha, Gertha. I couldn't even say Gertha. Gertha. She'd come running to me, and I'd, she'd jump up my wagon, my left, I'd rub her. She'd go, Gertha, Gertha, Gertha. She just sang. <laughs> Boy, now that was living. We were living high on the hog back then. But supper time was the time when everybody got to communicate. And we talked about things. But uh, my parents were strict. I remember we grew tomatoes, and I grew tomatoes, and Daddy and him helped. And uh, he told me one day, he said, at the end of the year, you had to pull up the tomato sticks. He said, son, when you get into school tomorrow, I want you to pull up them tomato sticks over there. Well, I got to play with my friend who come down, and I forgot about it. But I got a friendly reminder. When my dad come in, he walked over in the field, he walked back and said, son, I thought I told you to pull up them tomato sticks over there. Yeah, I forgot. He said, well, when I get home tomorrow, if they're not pulled up, I'm going to pull one of them up. He didn't have to say nothing else. I knew what that meant. 
because he was going to use it on me. Now, they, now, when you get grandkids, they say, my mama used to tell me, now, Lord made a place to whoop them. I said, I wish he'd have showed it to you when I was coming up because you didn't know where it was. Wherever you reached with whatever you had in your hand, that's what you, wham, bam, you know. Guess what? The tomato sticks got up because I knew when Daddy said, get them up, they're going to be up. But they, 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 had a, they had a rule, and they, they, they made you obey. You had to get in line. I mean, you had to. But we, we had some things, so we appreciated that. We had a big appreciation for what you had. But we didn't realize really what a blessed time it was because at supper time, we got to communicate. We got to talk. We got to communicate with each other. And that's something that's missing in a lot of today's society. And uh, these, actually, I wish it could be restored. But uh, you find the story of uh, a Shunite woman. Driver don't even call her by name. Saw the prophet come by. And uh, she perceived that this was a man of God. She invited him in to have supper with her and her husband. Perceived he was, a, you know, women can have a lot of perception sometimes. People think, when you get to studying women in the Bible, you know some powerful women in the Bible. I mean, really, some really, even in the New Testament, there was women that prophesied. People think all a woman's supposed to do is get in the corner and keep her mouth shut. But if it wasn't for women around here, we couldn't run this place. We'd just shut it down. I'm serious. They do a lot for the work of God around here. They teach Sunday schools. They, they sing. They work. They, they decorate. They, 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 they do a lot of things. It, it's, uh, you know, that scripture deals with a woman being the weaker vessel. Doesn't mean, that doesn't mean what a lot of people try to make it out to be. And I know the Bible tells you to obey your husband, and the Bible tells husbands to love your wives. And uh, why? Because women have trouble with obedience, and men have trouble with showing love as a natural thing. Now, sometimes that's totally reversed. Sometimes it's the woman that likes to show love. I mean, the man that likes to show love and the woman that don't. But that, that can be reversed. But as a general thing, it's the man his attitude is, I told you I loved you when you married you, and when I changed my mind, I'll let you know. You know. But uh, a woman wants to have love shown to her. Because how many of those I always teach? Love unshown is love unknown. If you love somebody, you need to do things to let them know that you love them. All right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Praise God. And... Uh, you, got, you, got, you need to do that. You need to do things for them to show the appreciation. Uh, the Bible tells you to do that. Matter of fact, you're commanded to do that in the New Testament. And uh, the Bible teaches us to do like that. And so we understand all that. But here she was. She said, I perceive this is a man of God. We need to build a room for him. And this was Elijah that was coming along. And the Bible doesn't even call her name. You know, we, we, get, we get big on personalities. But the Bible didn't even call her name. It's called her a Shunammite woman. Actually, it's a woman of Shunammite. And uh, finally, after taking care of the prophet for a while, he said, you know, is there anything I can do for you? And he asked her, could I mention the king to you? Is there anything I can, you've been so good to me. She said, oh, no, we lived ourselves. We, we'll live with our own people. We'll do all their own people. I don't need none of that. We just, we're good. We just want to bless you. And uh, so... Gehazi realized, said, well, she don't have a son. And said, well, you know, what about if I give you a, you know, I'm going to, uh, would you like a son? Oh, you're going to have a son. She re he realized, so he just prayed, you're going to have a son. Oh, don't lie to me. Don't deceive me. You know, because her husband was old. But when a man of God speaks, if it's of God, it's going to happen. Amen. I used to have a little, uh, years ago, I got an anointing on me to pray for women that were barren and they would have children. And I, I did that several times when I was pastoring and would all preaching conferences and stuff that I prayed for women that were barren. And I told one of my speaker members in Colorado, I prayed for a lady I'd never seen her in my life, said, in nine months you're going to have a son. And she later sent me a thing and showed me a picture of her son and she couldn't have children. If God anoints you to speak something that is the line with God, and it's going to happen, amen. So it was just God using me in a prophetic utterance. It had more to do with God than it did with me. But 
Elijah said that, and she had the son. And as he got older, one day in the field, he fell dead. And uh, when well, he didn't fall dead, he got sick. Let me correct this. She, they took him and carried it to the mother, and he stayed on her, on her lap till he died. The Bible said at noon. So you know what she did? She took this lad and put him on the prophet's bed, not in his own bed, on the prophet's bed, the man of God's bed. And they said, uh, get me a donkey and a helper. We're going to see the man of God. Well, what's going on? She, you know what she said? By faith, all is well. We're talking about speaking the word by faith. Here her son is dead. But she says, all is well. Because she believed if God could give her a son, God could raise her son from the dead. She had that faith. And so she took off after Elijah. Well, they saw her coming. And he said, something's wrong. And uh, Gehazi, go check this out. He said, something's wrong. And so Gehazi said, how is it? She said, all is well. She got to the man of God. She fell at his feet and grabbed him. Gehazi was going to cast her aside, but he said, let her alone. Something is bothering her spirit, and the Lord has hid it from me. And she said, I told you not to deceive me about this son. But then he knew. Something had happened to the son. He said, Gehazi, take this staff and go lay it on the boy's face. And he said, okay now, everything's okay. She said, uh-uh, I ain't leaving. You're coming with me. You're the one who promised me this. You're coming with me. I'm not trusting in a lifeless staff and a servant. You're the one that spoke this. I'm not leaving here without you. Gehazi went and laid the staff on the boy. Guess what? Nothing happened. Sometimes just using a lifeless crutch or a staff isn't enough. Sometimes we have to get involved with what we say and do in life. So Elijah had to go there. Saw the boy still dead. He stretched his hands on his hands, his mouth on his mouth his body over his body, and the boy got warm. He prayed to the Lord first, then he did this, and the boy's body got warm, but he didn't live. He got up and he prayed some more. He went back and did it again, and this time the boy sneezed seven times, opened his eyes, he was totally alive. See, sometimes you gotta put your hands on their hands. You gotta breathe into them. You gotta get really involved in what you're doing. Sometimes we just want to throw something out there and hope it works. No, sometimes God requires us to really get involved in what we're doing for Him and to put something into it, and He'll make it live. If you're willing to get, on, get involved and, and breathe that breath. And so God raised him up, and she went, she went of course, glad, and that was the end of that story. Went on to a lot of other things. But I want to go one last little thing and then I'm going to track off into something else here. Another lady we have mentioned of in the Bible is Hannah. And uh, Hannah couldn't have children. She was married to a man and uh, couldn't have, she couldn't have children. And uh, this man also had another wife, which was a lot of times in the Bible. Uh, they had another wife. And uh, so uh, Hannah was really... Uh, grieved about this and uh, the Bible said I believe her name was Penelope or something like that and she would actually mock her and uh, because she couldn't have children and her husband was really loved her actually more than he did the other woman but she just couldn't be comforted because it's really a mother back especially in that day in the day and hour they lived, it meant a lot for a woman to be able to produce sons for her husband. That was a big thing. Okay? It was a big thing back in that day in Israel. Because it had a lot to do with coventry, had a lot to do with inheritance. 
It's a lot to do with the firstborn, all that kind of stuff. It was a lot to deal with the covenants of Israel and how it worked within the families. But it was a big deal. And for her not to be able to bear children to her husband, she just felt nothing could comfort her. She just, and he said, I don't know why you're so upset. So when they'd go up to worship once a year, so they were religious people, they loved God, went up to worship. Uh, he would set her in a high place there and said, I give you twice as much as I'd give off ten son. I don't understand why you're grieved. And she said, I want to bear children. And what she, I want to have a son. I want to bear children. And so, of course, you know the story of how she went into the temple and where uh, Eli was. And she was there praying and interceding before God. And Eli thought she was drunk because she couldn't understand what she was saying. And he, he rebuked her for being drunk. Why are you coming here drinking like that? You shouldn't be coming in the temple. Oh, she said, I'm not a servant of Belial. I'm not drunk. I'm just grieved. Uh, I want to have children. And he said, uh, and I cannot. And he said, whatever your heart's desire is, God is going to grant it. And she said, God, if you will grant me a son, I will give him back to you. And he'll belong to you, God. I will lend him right back to you. And he will, he will be your, your son. And so, then she went to Eli and asked him when he told her, you're going to have this son. About time of having babies, which now I guess the same as back then, about nine months later. She had a baby, boy. Which became known as Samuel. Which became one of the greatest prophets in Israel. Matter of fact, at that time, he was one of the only prophets around there. But there was no open vision, the Bible said. It was in a time of famine. It was in a time there wasn't much spiritual happenings in Israel. There was a lot of sin in Israel. And uh, so uh, after that she weaned him, she didn't even go up to worship till after she weaned the child. So I'm telling you, weaned kids at a pretty young age. Of course, back then it was longer than it is now. Back then, it was probably around two years old. And uh, it was a lot older because they didn't have the facilities we have now and the, the understanding we have now and the abilities we have now. So they weaned the child a little older. So when he was weaned, she came up and she gave the child to, to Eli and said, here he is. And once a year, she would make a coat and bring it to him and she would see the child. Now, this is sacrifice, folks. This is a woman keeping her word. This is a woman that believes in God. This is a woman that's motivated by love. She wanted to have a child so bad that if God would give her one, I'd give him back to you. And the Bible says as Samuel was in the temple, he was young, and I almost wish the teenagers were in here today because I think sometimes we don't realize how young people can serve the Lord. Well, there were some men became kings at eight years old in the Bible. Of course, they had a tutor that was over them, and they had to have help, but they actually inherited the throne at eight years old. And uh, I don't know how old he was when he began to hear the voice of God, but he was in the temple one night, and he heard a voice, and he thought it was, Sam, thought it was Eli, so he said, uh, Eli, you call me? He said, no, I didn't call you. So he heard it again, Samuel, Samuel. So he goes to Eli, Eli, you're calling me. No, I didn't call you. He said, oh. His the Bible said he didn't know the voice of God. Samuel didn't. He never heard the voice of God. But Eli perceived that's God talking to this boy. He's trying to talk to you. So he said, next time you hear this voice, you say, speak, Lord. And he, Eli really didn't want to hear what he had to say. You talk about how we influence our children. Well, let me tell you something. Parental influence is a powerful thing. I'm going to just tell you something that concerns me this day and hour. I'm really concerned if we're really reaching our children or not. Are we just giving them things and proving our love to them with things? Are we really putting the need to have relationship with God in them and the need of God in them like we need to be putting there? 
I'll just let you think about that. But it's something that's bothered me a lot. Often said, because children are going to react according to how you let them act and how you influence them. Now when Samuel heard what God said, this is what God said. Eli has let his sons become wicked in the temple. His sons were actually making prostitution of the temple. They were taking bribes at the temple door. They were just totally wicked, his sons were. And of course, God eventually killed them. But he, he told he said, I'm not going to let, because Eli didn't stop it. Eli rebuked them. It's right in the Bible where he rebuked them. said, you shouldn't be doing this. It's, all Israel's hear this. You're making Israel to sin right here in the temple. But he didn't stop them. He just tried to talk them into not doing it. I'm going to tell you, when a kid is eight years old and you say we're going to church and they say no and you let them stay home, you got a problem. If you collect one old man said, well, you may not go to church, but your arm's coming to church and my dad would grab my arm and it was going to church. If you, if you want to come with your arm, that's fine, but... Your arms coming to church. I didn't have a choice if I went to church when I was a kid. If my parents went to church, I went to church. I don't want to go today. It don't matter if you want to go or not. You better be ready or you're going to wish you was ready. Because you're going. You know what I'm saying? Today, it, it, it concerns me about parental influence and the things that we sometimes do. And I realize kids can be hard to manage. But God really brought judgment into Eli's house and ended up in the death of his two sons. And uh, he, this is what Samuel heard. He said, I'm going to bring judgment against the house of Eli because he didn't. Now, Eli didn't do this. He rebuked him, but he didn't stop it. You see what the difference is here. Because he allowed it, God judged him. And, of course, he ended up falling over dead. And uh, God killed his two sons. Why? Because they didn't, he didn't discipline. He allowed things to go on that shouldn't be allowed to go on. And I'm going to tell you, kids are going to, you can tell kids all day long what they ought to do. But they're going to be more of what you are than what you tell them. I've seen some folks bring their kids to church. Then I see pictures on Facebook of them at a beer party with a cigarette in their hand partying with their friends. Boy, it's really quiet in here right now. You think them kids are going to serve God? Just, I mean, it's good to bring them to church. But if you want to put conviction in them, you're going to have to stop your sinful lifestyle. They're going to have to see something in you that serves God. If you want to convince a child they're right, you're going to have to serve the Lord. You're going to, have to be an example to them. You want them to pray? They need to see you praying. You want them to love their wife? Then you need to love yours. You don't hurt the kids catch you putting your arm around mom and every now and then giving her a hug, telling her you love her. But it don't do no good to cuss them out to get them to church. Because you've already lost your testimony. You know, what we live before these children, just like my son said when he's preached at Father's Day, he said, I didn't fear God when I was a kid. I feared Larry Smith. He said, I knew God probably forgive me. He said, I knew what he was going to do to me. The Bible said, train up a child in the way he ought to go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. He might go out for a while, but he'll eventually probably that, that, that what he knew was right is going to come back. But they need to see something real, and not that we not, don't make mistakes, and not that we all occasionally don't say angry things in a moment of frustration that we have to repent of. Now, I would ask for a show of hands, but 
I'd create a lot of hypocrites and liars. I don't want to do that right now. Because we'd all be ashamed to admit, oh, I got, I got angry and said so. You see, I've actually got, I've actually got at some folks' house just jiving and having fun sometimes to say things, you know, about someone I shouldn't have said. And, and, and the Holy Ghost convict me on the way home. I think, oh, God, I shouldn't have said that. Now, you never had that happen to you, but I have. I know all these perfect folks in this church, they ain't never had that happen to them. Those imperfect people. But I, mean, I think the children can make room for realizing we're not perfect. But when they see overall your desire to please God, your desire to serve God, and I keep telling people one of the best things you can do for your child is have some, it don't, it don't have to be an hour prayer. If you could have a five-minute prayer, a ten-minute prayer with your children at night and just pray, that would make them believe. This thing, they really believe what they're doing because they've stopped the day long enough to pray over the day. It'd be, it'd be something, let's all gather around before we go to school. God, I want you to help the children today, touch their minds, Father, keep your hand. If you just did that for three minutes, two minutes, every morning, that's going to do more for your kids than you could ever imagine. Now, they're not in here now, so they won't know who told you this. Act like it was your idea. Go home and practice this. But see, if you're going to tell them, see, they need to see you practicing God. Does this make any sense to anybody? Because influence in the home is a powerful thing. They're going to be more what you are than what you want, tell them you want them to be. Because if they see sincerity, in you, they want to be sincere about God too. And you need to tell them things. You know, I want you to be blessed, but you can't forget God. God is the reason I'm able to do this. When I get my kids something, I tell them, God, now I'm a little different at Christmas time to somebody, I get my kids gifts. I don't celebrate a lot of things a lot of people celebrate. Because I understand there's a lot of paganistic stuff that's been brought into Christianity. I'm not condemning nobody, but I'm just telling you what I do. I don't want anything to do with it. I just, I just tell my kids, Santa Claus didn't bring you this. Because I'm going to tell you the most difficult thing I had to deal with in my childhood, and it was really, I'm telling you, it was one of the first most difficult things I ever had to deal with in my childhood. It was when I found out at the age of about five or six or seven or whenever it was, because a man at the store told me, there ain't no Santa Claus. I said, oh, you're lying. Because my mom and dad told me there was. You see what I'm saying? It's when I find out they had lied and deceived me all them years. That did something to me. It affected me. What else are you lying about? Oh, I don't hurt. I'm going to tell you, I'll hurt your kids' feelings. If I can. I mean, I, let me just ask you, is there a Santa Claus? Then why are you telling your kids there's one? I told them, you, you, I, I, it, 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 it's Christmas. It, yeah, but let me tell you something. All you got to do is tell them, tell them, look, God blessed me to give you this. Hello? Y'all hearing what I'm saying? God, that's okay. This is just children. Give me back your attention. God bless me to be able to buy this for you. This is what I tell my kids. I gave them something because if you don't, well, I'm not going to celebrate anything, so I'm, I'm not going to give you nothing you can't have. Now, my kids is going to go to school, and everybody in school is going to wonder, what would you get? And they're going to have to deal with a lot of embarrassment and a lot of junk that I don't want them to have to deal with. Because an idol is nothing. That's what the Bible says, isn't it? An idol is nothing. It's nothing. Because I personally believe that, that when they brought that over into Christianity, it was done to mock the crucifixion of Jesus. That's why they put him in a scarlet robe. That's why they're saying he knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. 
He knows if you've been good or bad. So be good for Sanny's sake, not Jesus. They made a deity out of him. They mocked the crucifixion. Christ's mass means mass, a celebration of the dead. That's what's handed to us by another religion. Christi Massi means crucifixion of Jesus. Merry crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus is dead. <laughs> and they sang Noel, 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 Noel. You know what hell is? It's the Hebrew word for God. No God, no God. And people don't even know what they're doing. But I don't get out and make a big deal. I'm just not going to do it. And I'm going to teach my kids that God gave me the money to buy you this. And you send me to hell for buying them something you want to, but I, I do it because I don't want my kids to feel bad. But they still know the truth about life and that God, you see, you need to turn all your blessings toward God. You need to turn everything in your home toward God. You need to, everything needs to be recognized toward God. So there's a lot of things I just don't do. I always told my kids why. There's nothing to this. this is what they teach. This is what man says. But there's nothing to that. This is what really God blesses us to do this. Every blessing we have came from above. Everything we are is of God. And I'm not sending nobody to hell over anything, okay? I'm just saying I don't want my children someday to look me in the eye and say, you lied to me. You misled me. I want them to know everything I tell them is the truth, even from the Word of God. And that's why I want them to respect what I say. And they knew if they didn't, I had something that would back it up. And kids are going to test you. I remember the first time Michael tested me. He's a pastor here now, but he hasn't always been a pastor. <laughs> Growing up, he was just a kid. And he got kind of working out on weights. So he got kind of big, you know. Got kind of strong. Got to where his mama couldn't handle him hardly when I was going off preaching. She, she'd go to hit him or something. He'd throw his hand up and buck up to her. Well, he forgot one day. I, I went to hit him. I threatened to hit him. He bucked up. Big mistake. <laughs> I didn't even. I didn't even hit him with a roundhouse. I just punched him like that and turned him a flip on his shoulder. And when he hit the floor, I said, now, next time, I'll draw back. You don't buck up to me, boy. And you better not be bucking up your mama either, because when I get home, I'm going to deal with you. Because there's still an authority in this house. You might be 15 years old, but there's still an authority in this house, and that's me. I'm going to tell you how I felt about my mama. When I was 40 years old, if my mama would have grabbed a switch and went to whoop me, I'd have stood there and took it because I had that much respect for her. Something about respect and authority and love. They know when you're loving them. They know when you're right. They know when you say don't play in the interstate, you're going to get run over, that you mean it. How many knows the Bible said foolish is born in the heart of a child? Is this right? But the rod of correction will what? Drive it far from them. Now I thank God. I, don't, I didn't raise, I, I made a lot of mistakes raising my kids. But I thank God that both of them's in church today. Amen. I thank God for that. And I thank God my grandkids are coming to church. How spiritual are they? I never know. Hallelujah. Just when you think you do, you don't. But it's up to us to put in them. Uh, I wish someday I'm going to go out and just talk to the teens. Because I'm going to tell you there's one area I think we fail in. Sometimes when new people come to this church, new teenagers, our teenagers need to embrace them. How many knows when people come to church, they're afraid. They come to a new church, especially they, they feel weird. They don't know nobody. So to have somebody smile, how you doing? 
good to have you here. That means a lot, my friend. It breaks down. That's what the coffee bar is for. It's, it's to break down that wall. It's to let people know we're real. We're people. We're real. We're here for you. We love you. But mother's motivation is powerful. I believe, you know what I believe today? I believe every one of you mothers really want what's best for your children. I really believe that with all my heart. I know we've all made mistakes, and I made enough. I always tell folks, I made enough mistakes in my life. You don't have to make any. I made enough of both of us. But you've got to learn, Bob. But we need to really be conscious, I think, and put in a conscience of our spirit. If we really love our children and we're motivated by a mother's love and a father's love, the Bible said, train that child up. We've got to discipline them. We got to love our wives in front of them. We got to love God. We got to be. We got to have some point. You know, if God's never mentioned in your home and just in the church, they're gonna think this whole thing is hypocrisy. I'm only. I only. They're gonna grow up thinking all I got to do is go to church, and put on a front at church on Sunday. I do what I want to the rest of the time, because God is only at church. We've got to put God in our homes with prayer and, and convictions and some rules that would keep a child in the way they should go. And when they grow up, they're going to have a consciousness of God and know what's right and wrong. I'm going to tell you, if you didn't believe what my mama said, she would impress it on you. And she knew just where to put the impression. My mama said, I'm going to impress this on your mind. I'm wondering where my brain was located. <laughs> and when she got through, impressed it on my seat, my mind got the message. When mama spoke, it was like E.F. Hutton. Yes, ma'am. Now, my daddy, I knew when he spoke, you better listen. My daddy only whooped me two or three times. Every time was when I got hurt. That's when my daddy whoop you when you got hurt. Especially if you're just doing something he told you not to do. I remember one time me and my friend were throwing a clot of dirt. And he said, y'all quit that. Me and my brother, I believe it was, in the field working, we throwing a, found a clot of dirt, we found a plow. We throwing, he said, quit that. You're going to get hurt. About that time I missed, and it hit me only in the finger, jammed my finger. Ah! Next thing I knew, Dad grabbed me. Wow! My feet went straight up in the air, waving like a flag. I told you to quit, boy. Guess what? I quit. <laughs> And guess what? I didn't even feel my finger hurting no more. <laughs> he totally healed that thing. I had a bigger pain. It was a pain in the backside. So, you know, it, 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 uh, they had their way of getting to you. Well, they taught me authority. They taught me respect for authority. So therefore, when the officer spoke, I believed him too. When God speaks, I believe him. Amen. I know you want your children. Let's, 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 let's just pray about this some. And let's, let's have a consciousness about our children. And make sure what we're giving them is not just gifts of man and things to make them happy. Let's give them the gift of God. Let's put a conviction of God in their heart. It's the best thing you'll ever give your child as a mother. And I know you're motivated by love. And if you love that child, best thing you can give them in life is conviction about the things of God. Amen. Let's all stand. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. I went later and I meant to. I think our musician is gone, isn't he? Looks like they are. Oh, there he is. He's been hiding back there. All right. But we really, that's all right. I don't know that we really need a musician because we got to get out of here. We don't. The Baptists are going to beat us to the restaurant. I may believe there's some truth to what I said today. Amen. I believe I've talked to some people who felt the same thing I'm feeling. Train up that child. We've got we to love them. 
but we've also got to discipline them. We've got to show them the right way. We've got to do things to make them have a conviction of God in the home. Praise the Lord. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I thank you for your word, for your spirit, God. I ask you, Lord, to give us understanding. Lord, as we come to you in prayer, I pray you would talk to our hearts and convict our hearts. Give us guidance, Lord. You know everything, and Lord, sometimes we struggle to know the right thing to do. I pray you would convict us and give us direction and guidance on how to put the conviction of God in our children. How to raise those children with the mind of God in their heart and the Spirit of God convicting them in their soul. How to raise them up to love us and to love you, Father. I pray as we seek you for that, that you would speak little things in our spirit and give us direction, God, that we could obey your voice. And our children would grow up trained in the way and knowing the way of God and loving the way of God. I thank you for it, Father. I'm going to believe you're going to help us do that, God. Thank you for every mother. I thank you for all the children and for the fathers even, Lord, that want to see their children raised in the way of the Lord. We thank you for everything. We're going to believe you're going to help us, God, and keep us in it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. God bless you. I'm going to let you go. And you can beat a few under the restaurant today. Amen. Thank you for coming. Amen.